All right. Well, hey, listen, uh, we're continuing our series, The Gospel According to Luke, today. But before I get into it, uh, I want to talk about something. Uh, and, you know, to be quite honest with you, I'm just, I'm just going to take a couple minutes and I want to be really transparent with you. I want to be really open with you. I want to be really honest with you. And as a result of this, you know, I may not say everything perfectly. I may not say everything in the best way, but I believe that the Holy Spirit uh, can take exactly what I'm saying and put it to the intention of, of what I believe. And it's, it's not the easiest thing. The easiest thing would be to, to not talk about this. The easiest thing would not be to be to, to, to skip over it or, or do something else. Or the safest thing would be say, hey, I don't want to ruffle any feathers or say anything. Maybe that could be misconstrued. But the more that I get the opportunity to read the Bible, the more that I see that the things that Jesus calls us to are rarely safe. And the things that Jesus calls us to are rarely the easy way. And the things that Jesus calls us to are rarely the things that don't ruffle feathers. Uh, in fact, all I see is Jesus calling you out into the storm and sending you to cast out demons and calling you to take over to the oppressed and speak for the people uh, who need spoken for. And so I believe that as a result of that, that this is something that... that we as a church need to have a conversation about and we need to talk about. And one conversation won't change anything, one thing, but that we need to start purposing our heart to discuss this. As, as most of you know and you've seen in the news, uh, we had yet another tragic death of George Floyd this, this last week. Uh, and, and we've seen the, the fallout from this. We've seen the division and the hatred that has sparked. We've seen the, the different things. And, and I want to talk about it for a minute because I think it's important. A man lost his life in an unjust way, in a way that should have never happened. And, and as a result, there's been all sorts of blowback. And, and here's the thing that I want to say. It was, it was wrong. It was 100% wrong. There was nothing about it that was justice, that was righteous, that was what was being called for. And the man who did it is, is a criminal and, and, in my opinion, did something that was just absolutely atrocious. But, but in that statement, I want to say this. He does not represent the majority of our police force in our United States. He, he doesn't. I know we have some amazing law enforcement officers here in this church. And you know what? Not only do I know that they would never do anything like that, I know they wouldn't stand by and allow something like that to happen because they stand for justice. Listen, the police have a very hard job. And, I, and I, I am thankful for them. I'm thankful that they, that they do what they do. And I'm not going to allow the actions of a very small few to be what paints the picture of how I view the amazing men and women who do a really great job every single day. I, I'm not going to allow that. And here's the, the other thing that I'm, I'm going to tell you. As a result of this, there's been some violent protests and some destruction and looting uh, and, and, and vandalism. And you know what? Uh, that's not okay. That, that those things are not okay. But I'm also not going to allow the actions of a few who are walking in hurt and who are walking in wounds and are walking in anger to be what dictates the way that I view an entire other culture of our African-American friends. Because, you know, what? I also know that that is not the majority of what people feel. That is not how people, they don't think that that's the right thing to do. And I'm also not going to say that because one group of people reacted in a certain way that it somehow negates the fact that another man lost his life. One of the things that I'm tired of is being put in a place where I feel like I'm constantly having to choose sides. Do you support the, the black, your black brothers and sisters or do you support police? Do you support this or do you support that? Do you support patriotism or do you support justice? And the reality is I support them both. I don't need to pick sides because the reality is what I stand for and what the Bible speaks of is standing for righteousness and truth. And you know what? I know that not every single police officer is perfect because they're human. And I know that every single person whose skin is darker than mine is not perfect. You know why? Because they're human just like me. But here's the thing that I know. I support justice. I support righteousness, and I don't believe that we should have a group within our society who don't feel safe, who live in fear, who feel like they have things that are unfair, because I know that's not the truth. And here's the reason why I'm telling you about it. This isn't just a thing so I can check it off my list or I can get rid of a guilty conscience. It's because I believe with my entire being that you and I and the church are the only things that have the answer, that in Jesus is the only answer. That in, in our relationship with God, that Christianity is the only world religion, the only world religion who has the answer that can actually defeat hate and defeat fear and defeat evil. 
Because here, here as a church in our culture, when we started this, this church, uh, the, the, took over this church and we started doing this, we, we took some time and we walked through our culture. And two of our culture codes that we think are important is that we do things with love and we do things together. Because we believe that perfect love casts out all fear, that love is not something that we do because someone else does it for us, that we love because he first loved us. And we do things together because we believe in the power of unity. And unity is not based on proximity. Unity is not based on race or gender. Unity is based on that we're united under Jesus Christ. And we have something as a result of Christianity that no other world religion has because only Christianity understands, God from the very beginning understands something that is so powerful, one of the greatest mysteries that, that, that can, we can talk about. And we actually celebrate part of this mystery today. Today, which is the day that uh, the church celebrates the day of Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit fell down, that we understand that the Christianity has something that, that is amazing, that is unique, is that God in our, in our God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit perfectly embody diversity and unity. The Trinity is a great mystery. The Trinity is something that we'll never fully understand, but we know through Scripture that we have the Godhead, that are three in one, that we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they are diverse and they each have different roles and they each have different personalities. They each have different things that they're called to do, and yet they are one and united. When Jesus says, I wish that they were one like you and I were one, he didn't mean that I wish that they looked exactly the same because the Son does not look like the Father. They had different perspectives, but he said if you've seen the son then you've seen the heart of the father because they carry it together that the father the son and the holy spirit though they have specific roles and specific tasks in a diversity there's a unity that's found into them there is only christianity that can explain diversity and unity that before creation they were together and they were diverse and they were unified and they were in love that is the exact thing that god spoke into existence when he created creation that there is something powerful in christianity Christianity that says it doesn't matter about the skin color, it doesn't matter about your gender, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You don't have to pretend like those differences don't exist. In fact, it's within those differences we find the purpose and we choose to walk in unity together. And here's the thing, church. Here, here's the thing. I don't want my kids to grow up and, and take over this race in the same place I got it. I know, I know that there's some people out there who say, racism doesn't exist anymore, these things, listen, if you're comparing it to history, then sure, we're a lot better, but just because we're better doesn't mean that it's right. Just because things are better today than they were 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, doesn't mean that we've arrived to where we need to be. And I believe that we have the answer, that we have the ability to make change. It's not a social media post. It's not a statement. It's not political. It's called walking in the love that God has for us and believing that perfect love casts out all fear. And listen, church, I'm not doing this. I'm not telling you because I think that you personally, that you are the problem. I'm talking to you because I believe that you personally carry the solution. We need change. We need a change in this kind. We need to allow the solution of Jesus. You know what the solution is to the pandemic fear? Jesus and the love that, that covers all fear. You know what the solution to this and this hate and this anger? It's Jesus. That's the solution. And we get to be carriers of that light. We get to be carriers of his goodness. And I'm telling you, church, that as a church, we can open it up more hearts and we can deliver more people from fear when we walk in the perfect love. And so here's the thing I want to do, and I want to pray for a second. Because... We didn't, we're not called to be judges of man. We're called to love the world. In fact, it said that Jesus didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we're supposed to reflect that heart. And let me tell you something, church. I am guilty of being judgmental. I am guilty of judging someone without knowing them. I'm guilty of making a decision about someone before I ever hear the words. I'm guilty of treating someone different based on something that they cannot control. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And I think if we were all truthful with ourselves, we've all found ourselves in that position. 
We've all found ourselves walking in something. And so here's the thing. The way that this solution works, the way that the truth works, comes to the very fact, fact that we get to understand that we have a God who loves us so much that he desires to fix things inside of us. And that when we invite God into the process, he says, I can help you become the man or the woman that you're called to be and to walk in the love that more closely reflects the Savior. And so for me, where does it start? It's, it starts with me. It starts with me in my heart. And, and speaking, speaking scripture like Psalms 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Point out anything, anything that offends you, God. Not because I think that you pointing it out makes you love me more, but it makes me be a better reflection of you. Show me. Show me what it is that I can do from heart. Show me what it is that I can teach in my home. Show me what it is that I can teach my four sons so that they can take this baton and they can run this race further so that they continue to walk in it. Show me. Show me. Show me something. And I want to take a second. I want to put a challenge out there. That if we look at the problem and we say, it's too big, I can't change it, I can't fix it. I, one person, you're right, one person cannot fix this. One person cannot change this. We cannot change history. We cannot change the hurt. We, I'm not calling you to accept the blame for everything that's ever happened. I'm not saying that you can pretend like it didn't happen. I'm saying that we can start with us and we can say we want to make a change in ourselves, in our house, where we're at. So God, if there's anything inside of me that's not from you. If there's anything inside of me that I've allowed in, if there's anything inside of me that my culture has created, if there's anything inside of me that is not from you, God, I pray that you seek it out, you show me, and you help me be freed from it. You, you, you help me walk in the love that you walk in towards me. You help me understand that there can be diversity and unity you help me see people the way that you see them. You help me love people the way that you love them. So Father God, if there's anything that I need to change in my heart, thank you that you show me that. Father God, if anything as a, as a church, as a family, who, whose desire is to be reflections of you, Father God, if there's anything in us that needs to be changed, Lord, help us see it. Help us be part of the solution, Father God, to walk in love. Help us be part of the solution that can look and can support the people that we're called to support, Father God, so that we can walk in the justice that we need to. Lord, for, for our black brothers and sisters who, who are angry and who are upset and who are fearful and who are anxious, Father God, we speak the blood of Jesus. We speak love. We speak hope. We speak truth to them, Father God. Lord, I pray that we can be part of the solution that brings peace to them. And Father God, for, our, for our, our, our family members and for our friends and for our church people who are in the law enforcement, Father God, who want desperately to perform their job correctly and uphold justice and righteousness and humanity. Lord, we speak for them. We speak protection over them. We speak safety over them. We speak that their hearts and their minds will be protected, Father God. Lord, and for our city, for our nation, who's hurting, who's reeling, who's wounded, Lord, we know the answer can only be found in you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for giving us the boldness and the bravery to speak truth and to speak love, that perfect love that casts all fear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I want to continue. It's, it, it's, it's something that is related that, that I, I think is an interesting story that can be found in the Book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 17. This is not a story that is unique to the book of Luke. In fact, it's found in Matthew and it's found in Mark. John apparently decided it wasn't good enough for his gospel. But this is a story, you probably heard the story. 
If you grew up in Sunday school, then you definitely heard the story because this is one of those famous ones. This is the, the story of the, of the paralyzed man, or, or some versions will even say that it's the paraplegic who had four friends who carried him to Jesus on a mat. And here's the story. Jesus had already been doing miracles. Jesus was already growing in stature. And all these people would come because Jesus did a few things in his life. It seems like we constantly find that he was either teaching, he was eating, he was praying, or he was healing. Like, that's what Jesus did. Like, he just kept doing those things. And so Jesus was in this house, and he was preaching, and he was teaching. I think he was even healing some people. But they brought this man who was paralyzed to Jesus, but they couldn't get in because the crowd was too great because it was a house. There, there was no space. So I want to read this, and I want to look at it. Verse 17 Chapter 5, it says, One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all of Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was, was strongly with Jesus. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat, or some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd, right in front of Jesus. I'm going to pause for a second. I think this is interesting. They bring this guy. They carry this guy. They believe that Jesus can heal someone. They believe that Jesus is in the answer. They believe that he can do something mighty. They carry him there, and they cannot get him in because of the crowd. Because of the crowd, they could not get in. Isn't it interesting that, that the, this crowd is what stops this man who's paralyzed from being able to see Jesus? That, that this crowd is the thing that is hindering the people to be able to get to Jesus. You know, if we were to line everybody up who was there, I'm sure there was a lot of people there who had some kind of sickness. I'm sure there was a lot of people there who were perfectly healthy. But I doubt there are many people whose lives were affected by their, their, their ailment as much as the man who cannot walk. The man who cannot work, the man who cannot walk, the man who's, who's, whose entire life is just completely 100% dependent on his begging. Like they bring this man and, and, and no one will let him through. The crowd is keeping this man from getting in to Jesus. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the very people who want to come hear Jesus can be the very thing that keeps someone who desperately needs Jesus to get to him? I never want to be the crowd. I never want to be the one who's, who is so intent on hearing Jesus that I forget that I, and as a result, I'm keeping people from getting to Jesus. Our church is not a crowd. In fact, our church is going to be, as we see this, is going to be much more like the four friends. Because here's the thing. This crowd who was there, they weren't there because they wanted to see, they, they were there because they wanted to see the Pharisees and the religion, they were there because they wanted to see something. They wanted to hear something. Yet the crowd is keeping people from Jesus. I think this is why Jesus often said when the crowds would get too big, he would leave. He would sneak off or he'd go on a boat or he'd go to the other side because he said the crowd, the crowd is keeping people who need to get to me from getting to me. Church is not a crowd. We're a community. We're a family. We're the people who look to serve each other. And so this crowd is, is keeping them but then they decided, hey, we can't get through. But they had another idea. And this is a crazy idea. This is something that I, I think most people would say, man, well, hey, we tried. But I guess we're going to have to carry you back. Or maybe this was just they were tired. Maybe those friends were like, we carried you all the way here, and we're not carrying you back. So we got to get you to Jesus, whatever it takes. And so you know what? We couldn't get through the front door. We couldn't get through the side. There was too much of a crowd, but we, we got an idea. It's kind of a crazy idea. But I think I can go over the top. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever had those friends who come up with really creative, crazy ideas in a certain situation that you think, no, that we shouldn't do that. We come up with these ideas all the time here at church, like because sometimes you don't have all the resources, sometimes you don't have all the manpower, sometimes you just got to do it, and the, the, you know, necessity is the inventor of creativity, and we do some really crazy things, and we got some crazy people who'll do stuff around here. But these four friends are like, hey, you know what? We are going to go over the top. We're going to get you on the roof, and you know what? We're going to go through and we're going to dig through. Now it's interesting because like I said, this is found in Luke, this is found in Matthew, and it's also found in Mark. Matthew in this story somehow forgets to tell the part about where they tore a hole in the roof. Mark didn't. And let me, Mark was written first. And let me tell you why Mark didn't. Mark, most people believe that Mark Obviously, it was written by Mark, but this was from the narration or from the view, from the story, from the mouth of Peter, you know, Peter the disciple. And guess whose house Jesus was staying at? It was Peter's house. And do you know what he remembered when he told that story? When some dudes went on top of his roof and they tore his roof down. You think Peter was excited about it? No, let me tell you why. Because when Luke came and interviewed Peter and said, hey, tell me about that story where Jesus healed that paralyzed man. He's like, oh, I'll tell you about it. You mean when they dug a hole through my roof? Yeah, not cool. And guess what? Jesus didn't do a miracle and fix it afterwards. They dug a hole through my roof. I think the New Living Translation gives this real, like, polite thing. It's like, they took off some tiles, like, organized in an organized fashion. No, they dug a hole through his roof. And it's a man-sized hole. Do you know that we still have leaks in this church? It's what keeps me close to Jesus, praying for rain. Like, it's, it's, and we don't have a man-sized hole anywhere. It just takes a pin drop to let water in. This guy's got a man-sized hole. And they lower him in front of Jesus. They lowered him in front of Jesus. Let's, Let's pick up. Verse 20. Seeing their faith. This is interesting. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Verse 20 is a big 20. Seeing the faith of the men who didn't take no for an answer, who didn't allow the crowd to stop them, who went up on the roof, who apparently just didn't care about Peter's house, dug a hole through it, and then look, seeing their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven. Did you know that your faith matters? Did you know that your faith matters not just for you but for others? Did you know that there's times when people can't walk themselves and that you get to walk for them? There's times when people can't stand themselves and you get to stand for them. Did you know that your faith makes a difference? Do you know that your faith moves Jesus, that you can be moved to compassion, that your faith makes a difference? The belief that you have and the belief that you walk in makes a difference not just for you but for others. And it's important that we understand that we need friends around us who can maybe stand up when we can't because maybe today you're at a good place and maybe today you can carry some someone who can't walk and maybe today you can dig a hole in the roof but that doesn't mean that six months from now you maybe don't need someone else who can stand in faith on your behalf who can carry you to Jesus I don't know if you've ever needed to be carried to Jesus but I have I don't know if you've ever been so broken and so paralyzed by fear that you couldn't even seem to pick yourself up to Jesus and you just had some friends who said you know what you may not be able to get there but I'll get you there who can get you in front of Jesus, but I have. And I can tell you, there's no greater love for people than for friends who are willing to take that burden and put it on themselves and carry you to Jesus. Your faith matters. Your friends matter. This is why it's important to know what kind of friends you have because if the friends you've surrounded yourself with are just gonna carry you to the bar or to another broken relationship or dump you off in a ditch or abandon you when you can't walk, guess what? Those friends aren't gonna help you. You need to have friends in your life who when things get rough and when things get bad and when you get paralyzed, they can carry you straight to the feet of Jesus even if it means digging a hole through somebody else's roof. That's the friends that you need to surround yourself with this morning. And if you say, hey, 
Pastor John, that I don't have four friends like that. I don't have one friend like that. I'm the only one. Guess what? We need to work on that. That's why small groups are important. That's why serving is important. That's why church is important. That's why community is important. Because we need people who will carry us to Jesus when we can't. And you need to be that person for someone else. Because your faith matters to Jesus. Verse 21. But the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus stirring up trouble. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? I want you to think about this for a second. Which is easier, to take a paralyzed man who came to be healed? Remember, there's no doubt. He came there to be able to walk. His friends brought them for him to be able to walk. They do not want to carry him away. Which is easier? When someone is here who cannot walk, who has a very visible problem that you can easily see, which is easier to say, hey, brother, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up and walk. I can say your sins are forgiven. Can you see that? Can you see when a man's sins are forgiven? Do you think something changes all of a sudden? Do you think like a demon comes out or an angel comes down or light starts shining? He could say it all at once. I can say it to anybody. Hey, brother, your sins are forgiven. Hey, sister, your sins are forgiven. And like there's no proof. I don't have to be checked. There's nothing that comes out of that. It's like, well, okay. All right, carry him out of there. His sins are forgiven. You're welcome. No one would know if it happened or not. You can say anything you want because there's no proof of it. He said, why are you questioning if I can forgive sins? Which is easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Because the problem is, if Jesus looks at this man and says, hey, get up and walk, now something has to happen that everyone can see. That man has to get up and walk. If he doesn't, then Jesus failed. No one could question Jesus if he actually forgave the sins because no one would know. But all of a sudden, he says, listen, you're questioning the thing that has no physical proof. Which is easier. Verse 24, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. I don't want us to miss something, church. Do you see that the healing, the physical healing, was so that there would be proof of the internal healing and the internal forgiveness? Did you see that the physical healing, the healing of the man's legs, was to show that he had the authority not just to do a healing, but that he had the authority to forgive sins? Do you see that the healing is the proof that the sins were forgiven? Does that sound maybe a little familiar? Like the resurrection is the proof that the payment for your sins were complete? Does it sound like maybe that sometimes we need to see and understand that there needs to be a healing that takes place so that people can understand that there's an unconditional love waiting for them that includes the forgiveness of sins? That there's a result of healing, that healing results in something, that a physical healing, a physical change can be proof that there is an underlying spiritual truth that has happened. A physical change. That this man was brought to Jesus for a physical change, but he, not, he, he didn't just receive a healing. He didn't just receive a healing. He received something that was far greater. He re- received 
forgiveness of sin. And the forgiveness of sin, that unconditional love, that is the thing that is actually life-changing. I'm sure many people say, wow, that guy's life was changed. The minute that he stood up and walked, his life was changed. But the truth was, his life was changed a few minutes earlier whenever Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. His eternity was changed. Jesus just spoke an eternal truth. I'm sure he was really excited to be able to walk. I'm sure he was really excited to be able to run. I'm sure he was really excited to be able to go do those things. And it was a complete change to his lifestyle. But at some point, that man died. And at some point, that man's legs stopped working. And at some point, those legs were of no good. But the thing that Jesus spoke first, the forgiveness of sins, is still good today, 2,000 years later. Because the change that Jesus can create on the inside is something that far outlasts the change that can be seen on the outside. And church, this story paints so many pictures. And something that can just be a few verses can have so much application to us. We are called to walk in faith. We are never called to be the people who get in the way of someone getting to Jesus. On the contrary, we are called to be the four friends who carry those people to Jesus. That we as a church and we as a family are called to carry people to the foot of Jesus. And even when they can't stand for themselves because they're paralyzed, we are called to walk that in. And so you know what? We live in a world that is paralyzed by a lot of things. People are paralyzed because of fear because of the virus. People are paralyzed because of fear because of the racial injustice. People are paralyzed because of the fear of economic situations. They're paralyzed because they don't know their job's coming back. They're paralyzed because they don't know what school's going to look like next year. They're paralyzed and they can't move and they're fearful. And they're looking for people who can say, hey, I understand you can't move right now. I've been there myself. But let me carry you to the foot of someone who can free you from that paralyzation. Church, the world is paralyzed. And though, although they may think all they need to do is walk, we know that Jesus can do something far greater. Because the root of the problem is fear. But the perfect love of Jesus casts out all fear. The perfect love of Jesus makes the way where there is no way. The perfect love of Jesus transforms life. The eternity-changing decision is what happens when we get to bring people to Jesus and their sins are forgiven. When we get to say nothing, no obstacle will get us away, no matter how hard it was. I'm sure it was a lot harder to get him on the roof than it would have been to walk through the door, but it took that extra step to get them to Jesus. And I want to be a church that's known like, hey, listen, we'll go the extra step. We'll go the extra mile. If we got to get you on the roof, we'll get you on the roof. Whatever it takes to get you to Jesus, we're willing to do it. And if we got to break Peter's house in the process, well, then so be it. He'll be fine. We, church, need to understand that we have the answer in Jesus. We have the answer in Jesus. And our world is desperately hurting, paralyzed. And Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. We get to carry that. We get to carry that message. We get to help our friends. We get to be that for someone. We get to share that love. We get to walk in in truth. We get to walk in unity. Church, this morning, I want to encourage you with this. That you would know that you have an important role to play in this race. That you are not here with no purpose. That you are not here with no consequence. That your life is not just a blip in the radar. That you would know that you matter, that you were put on this earth with a purpose, and your purpose is different than my purpose, which is different than the person's purpose next to you, but you matter, and you make a difference, and you make an eternal change for someone. Don't ever believe that you're just here, 
that it doesn't matter what you do. No, we are in a race, and how you run matters. And we are going to run that race with love, and we're going to run that race together. We're not going to group certain things into categories. We're not going to group people into categories. We are going to walk and see people how God sees us. We're going to be reflective on what God's calling us to so that we can know that when the time comes for us to need to stand in faith for our brothers and sisters who maybe can't stand for themselves, that we'll do it and we'll be ready. And when it's our turn to need someone to stand for us, we will be surrounded by people who say, you know what, we'll get you there. We'll get you there. You know, I'm thankful that today I can stand in front of you. But I'm even more thankful that I know that if I couldn't, I have friends who'd get me there. That I have family who could get me there. I have people who would point me to Jesus. That's who I want us to be, church. And on this day, the Sunday where we celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, we know that the, not only do we serve the God, the, the Father who created everything, and Jesus who performed this amazing sacrifice, but that that Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, makes his home among us. And when we invite him in, We'll search in our hearts and our minds for anything that isn't best for us and help us remove fear and help us remove anxiety and help us remove judgment and help us remove incorrect thinking and help us remove incorrect theology and help us remove hurt because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in not to condemn you of your guilt, but to condemn you and to remind you of your righteousness and that he only has the best for you. That Jesus made a way. Maybe you're here today. You've never accepted Jesus. We're going to say a short prayer. And it really is that easy. When you accept what Jesus has done, your whole life has changed. Because it just takes getting to the foot of Jesus for your whole life to be changed. And if that's you, I just want you to pray this prayer. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so my sins could be forgiven and so that my heart and my mind could be made free. So in Jesus' holy name we pray. Maybe you're here today and this whole message, whether it was the first part or looking at this parable or the, this story of Jesus and Luke. I pray that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and that lives in you today will give you the boldness and the faith and the bravery to stand up for what you know is truth. To say, I can't change everything, I can't fix everything, but I can allow Jesus to fix me. I can allow his spirit to move in me. I can allow to be the, the, I can take that step from me. I can be that friend for someone else who's hurting. I can be that light when in the darkness and I can walk in love even if everything around me is filled with hate. Because love will conquer death. Love will conquer fear. And until we see that day for eternity, we get to help create that here on earth. And I believe that we can change our city, we can change our community, we can change our state, we can literally change the face of the planet through the power of Jesus. And I'm thankful that we get to be a church that gets to be part of the solution of bringing people to Jesus. Father God, for every man and every woman who's listening today, I pray for your peace. I pray for your wisdom. I pray for your leading. I pray for the, the, the Holy Spirit to, to pull on our hearts and to show us some ways that we can grow, Father God. We love you so much.
thank you, Father God, that your spirit is here with us. Perfecting us day by day, completing the work that you started in us. You are faithful to see it to completion. So in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. My church, listen, know you're loved, know you're prayed for. Know that I am literally counting down the days till next week where we get to be together physically. We love you. Have a great rest of your Sunday. You are dismissed.